are you ovulating? Because that's how everything makes sense. And I, I, need, I know, you know, possibly your listeners already know all about this. So maybe that doesn't, is less important for them. But I know certainly for some of my readers and followers, they're trying to answer questions about estrogen and progesterone without understanding that ovulation is how you make progesterone. <laughs> it's like the center events. First off, like our viewers might not know who you are. So who are you? And tell us a little bit about like how you got into the field of medicine and women's wellness. Yeah. So as you can probably hear from my accent, I'm Canadian. Um, I started out actually working in evolutionary biology in Canada a long time ago, 25, 30 years ago. And then I trained as a naturopathic doctor in Toronto. And I started out in general practice, but quickly started focusing on women because that's who was coming to see me. And then in the early 2000s, I moved to Sydney, Australia, and I lived there for almost 15 years. I had a very busy clinic there, hormone clinic. And out of that work came my first book, Period Repair Manual, which is all about how to have healthy periods without hormonal birth control. And now I live in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, where I also have consulting rooms here now. And I've since then released a second book, which is for women over 40, which is sort of one of my new passions. That's exciting. Um, so the <clears throat> the topic of the month for that we're doing, you know, these interviews about is getting off the pill. Okay. A lot of women are nervous about getting off the pill or they've already done it or they've heard things from their doctor that they, you know, either should or shouldn't do it. So like just off the cuff, like what's your advice for women getting off the pill? As you can imagine, it's so individual. I know everyone says that, that's kind of cliche, but it truly, truly is. I guess the starting place is just the very first piece of information that I'm, as you know, I'm trying to get out there that I think is very important is just to explain that pill bleeds are not periods. So for anyone who's been prescribed the pill to regulate the period, as you know, that makes no sense. Like that's not a reason to take the pill. So I guess that would be in part an answer to you. If you're taking the pill to regulate your period, then no, there's there are better solutions than that because of course there's value in having a natural ovulatory menstrual cycle. I'm a cheerleader for women's hormones. Natural cycling is how we make hormones. So that gives you an angle. I mean, I'm obviously not a fan of hormonal birth control in general, but I will at the same time acknowledge that um, it can have its place and certainly it can help to avoid pregnancy. There's no question about that as, as we both agree. There's other ways to do that. Um, but And also contraceptive drugs can help to relieve some symptoms of menstruation, like distress, like endometriosis and strong premenstrual mood and things like that. I, of course, in my work and in my books, I offer alternative strategies for some of those symptoms. But I just always phrase it this way, just for those that person who's listening, who's thinking, oh, no, you know, I'm different. I can't come off the pill because, you know, whatever it is, I've got these severe symptoms. So there's usually a way off. I think the better place is to be off the pill. Um, I think we should also just differentiate between some of the different types of hormonal birth control if you want to do that, because I think that's actually quite important. Yeah. Um, so combined methods, which would be the pill or the NuvaRing or the patch, they work by s switching off the ovaries, basically inducing a, essentially chemical menopause, temporary chemical, chemical menopause. And like, for example, if you were to measure, try to do a blood test for hormones when you're on the pill for estradiol and progesterone, you would find none because those contraceptive drugs, although they're hormone-like, they're not hormones. They're not the same as our own estradiol and progesterone. So on the pill, you just, or on the NuvaRing, you just get a monthly fake bleed, withdrawal bleed from those contraceptive drugs. That's what I mean by, you know, pill bleeds are not periods. Then there's the progestin-only methods, which I... I just like to explain this to women because I feel like this can help when you're making a decision. <clears throat> Excuse me, with the implant, with the implants, um, 
there will be what's called anovulatory cycling, or you are still making estrogen, and it's kind of going up and down, and you can get sort of somewhat regular or irregular bleeding from that. Those are, again, those are not menstrual cycles. Yeah. When you said implants, do you mean IUD or do you mean... No, like I mean the, the arm implants. Yeah. The good one question. that goes in the arm. Okay. Yeah. So the IUD is different again. The hormonal IUD is actually the only type of hormonal birth control that can permit ovulatory cycling. Not always, because depending on the woman and especially in the first year of use when the dose of the drug is higher it can suppress ovulation. But the hormonal LED is a little bit different in that it obviously can dramatically lighten flow, which can be important for some women if, if, if they're suffering very, very heavy flow or pain, um, but it permits ovulatory cycling. So it's a little different. One thing I like to say, I think helps to illustrate it, um, with the pill, you bleed, but don't cycle which obviously makes no sense, <laughs> with the hormonal IUD, interestingly, you can cycle but not bleed because it can you know, thin the uterine lining to the point that you don't get a bleed even though you're still going through the menstrual cycle. Never thought yeah. of it that way, but yeah. that makes sense. For a lot of women and a lot of women who contact natural womanhood, they're in this place of they did get on the pill for painful periods, yes. endometriosis, PCOS, like – these things that we don't have concrete, easy answers for. Um, and so they're fearful about getting off because their symptoms most likely will come back. Um, or I don't know, maybe you know something different. No, um, of course they will. They, they, they'll, they'll, as soon as you unmask the periods, as you start having real periods again, yeah, the whatever was the underlying issue going on with your periods is, is still there. Um, what would your advice be for someone in that position where they know they have a hormonal disorder, but they're scared to have to, you know, tackle it? Trust your body. You know, this is the key message. You know that my first book, Period to Peer Manual, ends with the sentence, trust your body. This is true. I would say, you know, and I've worked in this field for 25 years. I've worked with thousands and thousands of women. Everyone always thinks, just to say again, everyone always thinks, oh, I'm different. My hormones are you know, too messed up. I'm too broken. I can't have cycles. I can't, you know, have healthy net menstrual cycles. I would just say to everyone listening, you, you almost always can. I mean, there are maybe a few very unusual situations where the symptoms are just too strong. But in most cases, there's another solution. So PCOS is actually one of the best examples of this um should we just talk about that for a minute because that's a that's polycystic ovary syndrome that's a reason a hormonal imbalance so certainly a reason a lot of women are put on the pill and it responds incredibly well to supplements and diet changes as well as actually there's a treatment called cyclic progesterone therapy using natural progesterone that can help with that condition so that's just sort of a, a sampler of some of the other kinds of interventions that can help. And then the benefit is you get your own cycle back. Like you actually reverse out of the symptom picture of PCOS and essentially reverse out of PCOS. And then you have normal periods and it's very empowering. I mean, I can say this from the work with my patients and my readers. It's so Women are so happy to get their own cycles back. It just um, makes sense, right? Because it's a sign that your body's working, that everything's working not just but partly from a fertility perspective of course that's very reassuring and good to be ovulating regularly but even for women where you know fertility is not their goal it's important to ovulate regularly because it's how we make hormones it's how we build metabolic reserve and this is for long-term health as well um, reduction of risk of uh, heart disease for example and dementia and healthier bones all of that we're healthier in all of those ways by ovulating regularly. And also I would point out, actually, I think there's a reduced risk of breast cancer from regular ovulation. And that's really to do with the benefits of progesterone that we make with ovulation. And I, I know I said it earlier, but I just have to say it again. There's no progesterone in any type of hormonal birth control. They, it always gets called progesterone only or progesterone IUD or... That's not progesterone. And that's one of my other key messages is I have a blog post called The Crucial Difference Between Progesterone and Progestins. 
it's a really big deal. And I'm a, quite a stickler for um, using the right words for things. That's one of the ways I'm trying to influence women's health is so we can be a little more precise in our language about, you know, what we're talking about. And progesterone it is such an amazing hormone. It's like, it's, but it's the Cinderella hormone, right? Like it sort of gets pushed to the side and it deserves to be kind of more center stage. Yeah. I think in my own um, teaching, uh, people hear about estrogen. Like I call estrogen yeah. like the magazine hormone. Like, right. We hear about it on the magazines at the supermarket, but progesterone is like the one that does like a lot of the heavy lifting. Like the yeah. estrogen's a fun hormone. It makes you feel like you you know have a lot of energy and everything, but without progesterone, yeah. you wouldn't benefit from estrogen. It's true. Um, one thing I notice is like, including myself, almost everyone is progesterone deficient. It seems. Yeah. I don't know if you feel that way. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, progesterone is hard to make, so estrogen is quite is easy to make. Um, progesterone. And just an interesting thing about progesterone. Fun fact, in a healthy menstrual cycle, we make 100 times more progesterone than we do estrogen. So it's it's no shirker, right? Like there's a large amount of it if we can get there. And I have a blog post called Roadmap to Ovulation. As you know, ovulation is just hard to do. Ovulation, I mean, when you're healthy, it's easy. And, and women do ovulate monthly, and that's great. But like there's lots of obstacles to ovulation if you're under eating, if you have insulin resistance, if your thyroid is not great, if you're missing literally any nutrient, <laughs> if you have too much stress, like all of those things can either blunt, like sort of, you know, blunt ovulation and have a shorter luteal phase or less robust progesterone or, and or just completely not ovulate, have an anovulatory cycle, which we know that even healthy women with normal hormones do have quite a few anovulatory cycles. It's just, it's, the body is constantly monitoring the situation and kind of the brain's deciding, am I healthy enough to make a baby right now? It's like this every month check in, am I healthy enough to make a baby? And that's how it's going to be able to make progesterone. <laughs> and the fact is that's true even if you don't want a baby, I mean, this is the way the body works. If you're going to have healthy hormones and healthy menstrual cycles, your body needs to at least be convinced that you are healthy enough to have a baby, make a baby. And so that's a big part of why progesterone is quite often deficient. It's just really hard to make. And we only get a, you know, couple decades of the, at the most of making it We from our like early 20s to late 30s mid to late 30s and then progesterone starts to go down and that's second puberty or perimenopause that's our 40s a lot of the heavy periods and anxiety and a lot of the symptoms in our 40s come from the drop making less progesterone than our brain and uterus and breasts were expecting and that side of things in our 40s is I mean that's just an inevitable part of perimenopause I mean yeah. I would just sort of reframe that that's nothing we've done wrong but there so we it's this precious time we get to make it for maybe 20 years at the most and if you switch that off with hormonal birth control then you don't get to make any progesterone which is really sad I'm getting a little off the topic of getting off the yeah. pill but I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on progesterone supplementation during perimenopause yes I'm is a that huge fan <laughs> as you know from my book hormone repair manual I think it um yeah, I'm a fan of taking progesterone. Not everyone needs it. I mean, obviously, it's individual again. But in both books, I draw pretty heavily on the work of Canadian endocrinologist, Geraldine Pryor, who has been a champion of progesterone for 30 years. She's a scientist. She's constantly trying to like bring the spotlight back on progesterone. She's done multiple studies and clinical trials. And yeah, she's her position in like in general would be if you are symptomatic in your 40s with perimenopause and you need something then the best place to start is progesterone um rather than estrogen so yeah i talk about that quite a lot and again just to say i mean this is like a repetitive <laughs> rec um comment but we're talking you and i right now we're talking about real progesterone in the u.s it's called prometrium is the brand name by prescription um in other countries, it's Eutrogestin. We're not talking about the Provera or Primulude or Progestins or IUDs or implants. Yeah, yeah. What is the difference between... <clears throat> Pro so Provera is a form of Progestin, right? Yeah, it's a Progestin. It's medroxy. It's called medroxyprogesterone, but it's quite androgenic. It's, it's different than progesterone. Yeah. 
One of the things that I know people talk a lot about is libido. I was wondering if you could touch on libido, like on hormonal contraception and then what it might look like off of hormonal contraception. Yeah. Well, the pill is notorious for reducing libido. It's sad because that's kind of almost become almost a joke. Like people sort of laugh about it over the last few decades, but it's it's very real and it's not surprising given its mechanism of reducing, you know, switching off ovaries. It also lowers testosterone quite a lot, which can affect libido. And some of that effect from the pill, a little worrying actually, can cause a sort of a longer lasting libido suppressing effect even once you stop it and the worrying thing is scientists Mm. don't know how long that goes on that's um partly due to a the way the pill increases something called shbg which will constantly just cause low testosterone even once you stop the pill so that's sort of a, a concerning aspect other there's so many factors in libido i always at this point like to mention there's the fact that other medications affect libido i think somehow that gets you know, overlooked in a lot of certainly articles I read about libido. So the bills, uh, the libido is affected by the pill, of course, um, but it's also affected by antihistamines, certain types of antidepressants, cholesterol lowering medication, stomach acid medication. So these are all things that you might sort of be unknowingly thinking, "What's where's my libido gone? But oh, it's that, you know, hay fever medication. So there's that side of things. I guess libido is also, especially for women, a real expression of general energy. So if you're under, you know, sleep deprived or underactive thyroid or low iron or low B12 or overworked or any of those things, I mean, the natural stressed, stressed <laughs> response to that is, yeah. is low libido. It's understandable. Actually, one, of the, one study I saw found one of the biggest factors in women's libido is getting enough sleep, which really makes sense. So I think there can be sort of a sort of a, somewhat of an overemphasis on the hormonal side of things when a lot of those other factors come into play. The other factor in libido for women is pain. So as you know, it's it's the stat the stats are a little concerning. It's something like one in five, one in four women, you know, somewhat regularly experience pain with sexual intercourse, and that can be from endometriosis or pelvic floor, or obviously all different kinds of reasons and that will affect libido because which makes sense if pain if sex is painful then you're sort of going to have a not a strong interest in that and so in that situation then the solution is to seek help for the pain because there's always there's always help available no matter what the cause I would just encourage women to not be shy to speak with your doctor about what's going on and see if you can get some help one of the studies I continually go back to that just like blows my mind is talking about the the cervical crypts and how mm. when you're on basically how the pill changes your cervix yeah. and can even it's it, it like correct me if I'm wrong here yeah. but it, it all it delays maturation but it also speeds it up at the same time. Oh. Um, yeah, in terms of this is the production of cervical fluid and all of this side of things. Um, yeah, to be honest, Cassie, I haven't sort of looked at all the sort of details around that cervical crypt research, but I, yeah, I, be- I have seen that. I believe you're right. Um, and it can take a while for that to recover when you come off the pill. Yeah. yeah. And um, so it takes a while. And then another thing is, I think for some people, they experience when it does come they're like, oh my gosh, there's so much. Oh know, yeah, the, the cervical pill. fluid. Yeah, that's yeah. Like someone who's going through puberty should know what cervical fluid is, 100%. so that when they yeah <laughs> are experiencing it, they don't. They're. I mean, I remember when I was a teenager thinking that like I needed to go to the doctor, you know. And I think a lot of women think that. A lot um, of women. Just to say, I've heard that story from so many young women, especially yeah, if you were put on the pill at 13 and you come off at 25, and suddenly you're seeing these big like jelly like you know um sort of fl- cervical fluid you're like what is the heck is going on yeah I've had women go to the doctor they think they have um yeast infections or thrush they think something really strange is going on yeah. so I am with you this is part of, part of body literacy I think women especially young women need to understand that that's a hormonal sign that's a sign of fertility potentially and I'm just taking on board with 
I think what you were saying is, which I think is probably right, is when you come off the pill, there's the potential to see perhaps temporarily even kind of more cervical fluid than you know, might have been with a with a natural with a cycle without having been. Is that what you're kind of saying? There's a sort of a post pill change in it. Yeah. yeah, like you mentioned, it's just it's so different for everyone. Yeah, you know, some someone might come off the pill and feel a hundred times better right away. Yeah, and then some women don't feel better right away, and they're like, oh, I have to get back on because this is this is terrible. What's the time limit? <laughs> like, what 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 can they do to to get through that? Yeah, good. it's a really good point. Yeah, so for some women, it's it's just a breeze. They come off, they feel great. Um, coming off, so it, it depends on two things, I guess, two, just to try to simplify it. Depends on what your periods were, your real periods were like before, what the symptom was. Whether If we're talking about premenstrual mood, if we're talking about endometriosis pain, if we're talking about skin, irregular periods, those all have slightly different timelines in terms of how quickly they return post pill and also how quickly they might take to resolve. And then the second factor is which pill are you trying to come off? Because I'll speak specifically to trying to come off Drospirone or Yasmin or Yaz or Cipdrone, which is, um, I don't, you don't have in the States, but in New Zealand, it's a very popular um, oral contraceptive is using um, a strong anti-androgen drug called Cipdrone. So coming off those drugs, so let's say Yaz or Yasmin, that's an anti-androgen drug. So there will be, especially if there was, if there were skin breakouts before, there will then pretty much almost guaranteed be post-pill acne that kicks in, not right away, but usually within three to six months of stopping the pill. And that can be worse skin than you've ever seen before and that's part of a drug withdrawal syndrome from that anti-androgen drug so there's like this kind of massive upregulation of skin oils sebum and so that would be someone who just to tell you you know what, what I hear from my patients is they had you know mild breakouts as a teenager they were put on that pill which works beautifully for skin. And then, you know, at 28, they're like, I'm going to try coming off. And then six months off the pill or maybe nine months off the pill, they're like, oh my goodness, my skin is like horrendous. And then they're they're probably diagnosed with PCOS at that point. That's partly the kind of post-pill PCOS that I talk about in my book because it's not hard to get a PCOS diagnosis, even if it's temporary. And then they're like, okay, I'm, I'm broken, clearly. Like my hormones are just, messed up like I, I can't function like this I must need the pill so then they go back on the pill so then the problem is like any amount of withdrawal from that drug that they'd managed to get through in that six to nine months they're kind of back to square one so eventually they're gonna have to come off that drug so I have I've written about that I work with that a lot with my patients trying to make a plan for post-pill acne it's usually about getting zinc in place, which I'm a big fan of zinc for skin, the supplement. And then, you know, looking at sugar, maybe in some cases looking at dairy products and maybe tr- making a plan to avoid those normal dairy, at least not forever, but for like a year or two during that post-pill time. So that's an example. Post-pill acne can take a couple years. So that's kind of the, maybe the, one of the mm. longer ones. Let's say premenstrual mood would be have a different timeline it's often it can flare up pretty dramatically in the first few months of the pill as your own hormones start to kick in there can be quite a big sort of histamine response as you start to make your own estrogen and maybe not ovulating great to start with so progesterone is not kicking in there's different factors and then just your hormone receptors themselves adjusting to a real cycle Um, the brain adjusting to an actual cycle and so that, the, the, like I say to my patients, just, you know, brace yourself. But if you have bad premenstrual mood in the first couple of cycles off the pill, that doesn't mean that's how it's always going to be. Like that's just your body kind of getting used to this really, in some cases, brand new situation of an ovulatory cycle. So that gives a, a couple of compare and contrast. And then, of course, there's the whole... Yeah issue of like period pain and if it's endometriosis that's a longer term project usually of trying to identify if that's what's going on so yeah 
It basically takes a lot of patience. It does. It's trust your body though. I think I just keep coming back to that because your body wants to ovulate. It wants to be healthy in every individual. There's, it's possible to feel a lot better than you do. I'd say for the vast majority of women, it's possible to get to symptom free natural cycles. Um, barring, I would say, obviously, if you're in your late 40s and heavy periods and perimenopause, obviously, that's a different situation. But for young women, I mean, the goal is robust, healthy, natural cycles that are symptom free. And for those that are coming off the pill and are trying to conceive, what is your general timeline? Yeah. It depends what we're talking about. I guess I would say usually three months, three months to kind of have some ovulatory cycles and, you know, good egg quality and I'm not sure how, I mean, I guess we have to also factor in cervical fluid and things like that, but I, normally I say three months and then also three months is kind of the magic point too, where I might do some blood testing at that point. Like I say, you know, give it three months. If you're not ovulating, let's after the pill, you know, that let's then do some blood, blood tests to try to work out what factors might be preventing ovulation, for example. And the three month, three to four month thing is also for men, right? I'll just put in there because fertility is 50% male and sperm is not in great shape in general across around around the world I think it's primarily because of environmental yeah. toxins and other factors so for anyone listening just a little heads up like you know trouble trouble becoming pregnant when there's no obvious explanation if you know you're ovulating and everything's working and you're not becoming pregnant there's a very good chance it's a male subclinical male issue. And even if their sperm count is in the normal range, there could be issues with motility and morphology and like genetic quality of sperm. So in general, I think men require a prenatal supplementation approach for what I, I say, I say, you know, tell your husband you're working on some super sperm. It's not to say that anything's wrong with him, but we're just trying to get like the best sperm possible. And that takes a hundred days. So that this is where, you know, a bit of lead time can lead to better quality eggs and sperm, which ultimately obviously is, leads to healthier outcome, both in terms of reduced miscarriage risk and healthy baby. Actually, sperm can increase miscarriage risk. I, I don't sort of veered into sperm, but it, every time we talk about fertility, because I've had so many patients over the years, like literally like hundreds where the woman is doing everything and like micromanaging her diet and like every single little thing. What can I change? What can I tweak? What can I do differently? And I'm like, it's your partner. I don't know what else to say. Like it's clearly <laughs> sperm. Like you can only do so much from your side of things. It's crazy when you look at what's happening to sperm. Yeah. Like, uh, just in the last 100 years, yeah. how um, the quality and the count has it's gone. Been in, it's been in free fall. This kind of articles about, you know, sperm and free fall and sort of sperm counts and, you know, of course, have to wonder what's the bottom of that. Like, I don't think it's going to bottom out to zero, but it's been going down. <laughs> I mean, that would be very concerning if it went straight to zero, but it's, it does in some men, of course. So like what, I mean, you touched a little bit on like your background, but like what informs your work? I'm really curious about biology and the human body. I'd say that's a lot of it. I'm just very curious about how things work. And I guess, part, I mean, obviously, I, I also genuinely want to help women. And when I've come to an understanding about something, I want women to know that, the, you know, doctors to know that. I think, yeah, the other thing too, is I just don't like it when things are wrong. <laughs> like, I'll just give you one of my little bugaboo. Like, I really don't like, I really don't like that pill bleeds are called periods and the, it's you know it's said that the pill can regulate the period like it's just my scientist brain just doesn't like that I'm like I just need that to not be talk said that way anymore like I need we if we can talk about sure we can talk about you know using contraceptive drugs to suppress ovulation and suppress menstruation and that's fine but like I, I just think we've had three generations now of just an emperor's new clothes really weird situation around the pill where we're using words to describe it that are just not correct you know saying the pill can regulate hormones when it shuts them down saying you know the pill can regulate periods when there's no month there's no medical reason to bleed monthly on the pill like I just well you kind of get the idea like yeah like I really don't like it when things are 
wrong <laughs> out there in the world. Yeah. So I just keep imagining the future generations of women and doctors and scientists, and even today this is happening, but like just who are like face palm what they did what they thought they thought it was fine wait what they use these these contraceptive drugs for generations to shut down ovarian function and you know thinking progestins are the same as progesterone when they have lots of opposite effects it just kind of like be like i don't understand how they did that and we the thing is we do that now for medicine of the past we think why did they do that that's just seems so weird and so that's that's what's coming for hormonal birth control. I mean, I think that the concept of drugs will be around for a while. And I certainly wouldn't want them removed. You know, I think women need access to them as an option. But yeah, the time's going to come when that is in the rearview mirror, I hope. And yeah, behind us. I do think when I get out of my little corner of the world, I forget that for a lot of women, birth control, hormonal birth control is just the norm. And the option I think for a lot of women is like, oh, well, I'm either on this hormonal contraception or I'm having 10 babies. And so there's no like middle ground that's, you know, talked about. And obviously there is. There are other ways to avoid pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. This is, we've been locked in a paradigm um, where basically one of the paradigms is that, you know, these contraceptive drugs are good enough for women's health. And obviously I don't think they are because I, I'm a cheerleader for hormones. I guess one thing I would just say in response to some of these studies about, you know, are the side effects significant? I just point out it's not just side effects in real time kind of with, you know, individual women. Obviously, that's important too. But there's sort of a longer term trajectory here. Like we know Professor Pryor, so linking back to her research, she's found that all types of hormonal birth control impair healthy bone growth in young women so there's this like um we have to obtain what's called peak bone density by our mid-20s to kind of around 30 and then those are the strong bones that are gonna keep us for the rest of our life like kind of last until 85 or 90 or wherever we're going and so there's the possibility very real possibility that being on hormonal birth control when you're young impairs that peak bone density so then what we're really talking about is an osteoporosis risk in like 60 years. So are the studies picking up on that? You know what I mean? Like there's, there's other biological things going on that the studies aren't picking up on. There was this one study and I can provide the citation for the show notes. It was a Canadian study, not Professor Pryor, but a different group. And they found that, see if I can say this correctly, that young women, so women who had been on the pill when they were a teenager or an adolescent, had an increased risk of depression later in life, even when they weren't on the pill. And the researchers says, said that's biologically plausible because adolescence is a time of calibration of the brain, of wiring of the brain and mood and neurotransmitters. And if you're on contraceptive drugs that obviously affect the brain during that key time or critical window, it makes sense that you could have essentially I mean, not to be dramatic, but like a permanent change to the brain that increases depression risk. So then, so what I'm trying to illustrate is then you kind of look at, let's say these women are now 30 and they, some of them are on the pill currently, but some of them are on the pill from 13 to 28, but not on the pill currently. And you're trying to compare them, to, like you're not potentially picking up the signal what you need to do is study women who never took hormonal birth control. You know, what they what happens to them through their whole life in terms of risk of different conditions. But that's really hard to study because obviously humans live a long time. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of work in, uh, I'm a lactation consultant, and there's a lot of research coming out that breast development that happens in your teens affects lactation yes. down the road. True. And so for a 15 year old getting on the pill, they're not thinking about breastfeeding. No. That's not something that yeah. they're, you know, thinking about. And then when they do have a kid in their late twenties, thirties, whatever age it is, twenties, um, that's one of the things I always ask about is yeah. were you on hormonal contraception as a teen? Um, because I see insufficient glandular tissue, yeah. um, not super frequently, but enough times that, y you know, you start to wonder like, well, what's really going on here? Agree. Agree. So I don't want to take up too much more of yeah. your time. Uh, 
but thank you so much for being yeah. here. Uh, my last question is what's like one thing that our viewers and listeners can do today to improve their hormonal health? Well, the, I just, I'm going to bring it back to the question of, are you ovulating? Because that's how everything makes sense. And I, I, need, I know, you know, possibly your listeners already know all about this. So maybe that doesn't, is less important for them. But I know certainly for some of my readers and followers, they're trying to answer questions about estrogen and progesterone without understanding that ovulation is how you make progesterone. <laughs> it's like the center event. So that's what I would say is if you're trying to understand female hormones and the menstrual cycle kind of bring it back to that and what are the potential obstacles to ovulation because that's what yeah that'll that's what will individualize treatment